Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction um, and happy and blessed International Women's Day. First of all, let me thank all of you for, uh, for all those who have been working so hard you know, behind the scenes to bring us together for this event. Tan Sri Liu for always being a great supporter of women, Angeline and her team, where's Angeline? Angeline and her team, um, and of course, all the generous panelists for making the time to be here today. I especially appreciate that you all are here this morning because I know there are a few competing events today. I know Maybank is having one, the UN is having one, the Australian High Commission is having one, a whole bunch. I think next year we're going to have to coordinate it so that we don't have to be at too many and to, to reject so many uh, you know, invitations. Um, clearly, International Women's Day is gaining momentum here in Malaysia. And globally, this day is taking on a difference this year as the hashtag MeToo and hashtag Time's Up movements go viral. We saw these at the Emmys, the Grammys, and, at, and to some extent at the Oscars recently. More interestingly for me was how the issues around gender inequality receives a lot more airtime now. And, it, and also, uh, for the first time, it, was, it gained some level of prominence in Davos at the World Economic Forum, the seat of global capitalism. I suspect that this airtime was due to the fact that the points were made by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, you know, the rock star of heads of government and heads of state. <laughs> Women do more part-time work, he said, more unpaid work than men. Um, when we remove the outer layer, we see that there are a host of barriers for women in the workplace. Now, he didn't say anything new. It was the messenger not the message, I suppose. But we must acknowledge that it was important and relevant, it was an important and relevant message. He gave us voice in that high profile event. History shows us that the debate, the arguments, and the fight for recognition of women's rights have taken various forms. From the early 20th century, the Britain, Britain suffragette movement fighting for women's right to vote to the American feminist movement of the late 60s and 70s, which some of us may recall as the burning of the bra kind of movement, which brought Gloria Steinem to the fore, and more recently, uh, Lean In Circles following the 2013 book by Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead, to what we have today. Let me bring the conversation back to Malaysia. Be patient as I list the timelines. We haven't done too badly. 1957. From the time of independence in 1957, Malaysian women have had the right to vote and to hold office. And women comprise half of the registered voters, so we can make a difference. I was, no, I was told not to make controversial statements today. <laughs> 19, 1975 the amendments to the Income Tax Act to allow wives to elect for separate assessment of their income tax. 1995, Malaysia ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, but we've taken reservations, and some of these reservations are kind of disturbing, and we still have women's groups um, fighting for us to remove some of those reservations. 1997, Malaysia ratified the ILO Convention on Equality of Wages between Men and Women. 1999, the Guardianship of Infants Act, 1961, was amended to give equal rights to mothers. And I thought that was really, really very progressive and very important for women. In 2001, we established the Ministry of Women and Family Development. And in 2004, we changed the name to Women of Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development. So in, in a sense, it got sort of watered down a bit. The focus sort of shifted, but then that's to be expected. But this list is not exhaustive. We've done well, but we still have much to do. For example, the Domestic Violence Act of 1994. This was implemented in 1996, but we still have questions around the implementation of that law. 
I'm not a lawyer, but I am made to understand that there are challenges around recognition of women under the law, and of course, cultural influences on how the law is implemented and enforced. So coming back to our theme today, reducing barriers, reshaping conversations, there are four points I'd like to make. First, voice. Those of us in positions of influence must be the voice of those who struggle to be heard or those whose stories may seem just too ordinary. I shared the influences of and love and lessons that I learned from the women in my family in a, a simple book that I wrote. I, I shared the stories of my grandmother, my mother, my aunties, very ordinary women, but, and, and whose stories will just disappear if we do not capture it, uh, if we do not capture them, rather. And the point is, the reason I did it was because I had the opportunity to provide voice to these women. Often, they don't have an opportunity to have their stories told. And I suppose that was what Justin Trudeau did in Davos. He gave voice. The message was the same. But because it was Justin Trudeau who spoke, folks took notice. It was carried on BBC, on CNN, you know. He got coverage, and, and so he did us a favor by giving voice to some of the concerns that we are so used to, we've, we've taken them for granted. So again, sometimes it's about the messenger and not the message. So those of us who have the opportunity and, and you know, the, the right to, the chance and blessed with opportunities to give voice, we should. Support, I think this morning when the MCs were talking, they talked of the support system behind working mothers. In the multi-dimensional roles that women play, we often struggle to separate our role of caregiver from that of formal work, separate work from home. Our male counterparts rarely talk of work-family balance. Gloria Steinem is quoted as saying, I've yet to be on a campus where most women weren't worrying about some aspect of, common, of combining marriage, children, and a career. I've yet to find one where men were worrying about the same. Yes, we are wired differently, but we need to bring these concerns to awareness. Yesterday on BFM, I, 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 list, I was listening in to this conversation um, between, two, between Melissa Idris and, and a young lawyer, and she, interestingly, highlighted the fact that when she was in university, one of the concerns of, of you know, that she and her other girlfriends had was about career and balancing family. You know, Gloria Steinem wrote about this in the 60s and 70s. But today, in 2018, you still have young women talking about this? I, I tend to be a bit concerned. Anyways, so clearly, we need to bring these issues to awareness. And that's my second point. Bringing it to consciousness or conscientization of, of some of these issues. We need to bring to the surface what some of us know in our hearts and minds, but maybe don't seem to the need to articulate them. Or just we take them for granted. In a book, Sandberg gives an example of a car park. She was pregnant and she had to park her car some distance, you know. If you read the book, you know how she, she talks about how she was so swollen and she had to waddle through and get to, to the office. It was at that point that she realized, oops, here's something I should do. I should get the car park for these women closer to the entrance of the office. I mean, it's a simple thing, but we don't think about these things. And clearly, she didn't think about these things until she was pregnant. So it's about, again, bringing, it, bringing these concerns to a level of awareness so that then we take the relevant action to support women in, in the organization. So we do need support. We need organizational support beyond just car parks. We need policy changes that would enable women to function more effectively. Flexible work arrangements, maybe. Effective child care and elder care, because it doesn't just stop at child care. As we get older, it's about looking after our parents and our in-laws. So, and then you have policies that support, very important for Malaysia, 
especially in the public sector. Private sector, maybe not so, but public sector for sure. We need policies that support the re-entry of women into the workplace. Um, in, in the civil service, if you leave to, for child caring, you cannot come back. The system doesn't allow you to come back. And we've been saying this ad nauseum and nothing yet, you know? So in the private sector, I'm told that there is a possibility, but the women, you need to reskill if you want to come back because the, at the rate things are developing, you, you cannot expect to come back two years later and expect to have status quo. The fourth point that I want to make is, is more difficult because it needs awareness, it needs advocacy on a global scale. This is, this is also one of the things that I've been talking about over the years. Again, people know about it, aware about it, but no traction. Because it's difficult. This is about care work. Unpaid care contributes to economic growth. You know, through a labor force that is fit, that's productive, that's capable of learning and creative. But it also drains the market of its female work. Care, care work means if you take time out from work and you're looking after the family, it contributes to economic growth. Some, some folks have even uh, tried to quantify it and say that it could add 10 to 39% to GDP. So the challenge is how do you factor care work into your calculation of economic growth and, and GDP? So the work that we do as caregivers, you know, although we're working in an office, we're contributing, that it goes to your GDP, the gross domestic, domestic product of a country. But when you go home and you're doing those things, say those of us who don't have helpers, so we are doing everything, we're cleaning, we're washing, you're looking after the kids, etc. That's also adding productivity because you're looking after your child so that you prepare him for, or her for school. But that portion is not contributed, that goes into a vacuum. It's not considered when we consider a contribution to economic growth. So it's, it's kind of difficult. This is something that we have talked about. You can't quantify. If a woman takes time out from work and devotes her time to looking after her parents or her children, she's considered as unemployed. Okay? So serious, seriously, there's something wrong with the way we look at economics. So anyways, I said you need advocacy on a global scale. You know, you can't have a few of us shouting here. So anyways, what do these developments say? They say that women have been speaking out but, and that the issues are not new. However, the fact remains that the challenges persist. It also means that some, to some extent we're not being heard. We are not there yet. Yes, I suppose that's why we're here this morning, that there are various other uh, events celebrating women, and rightly so. This is another opportunity for us to remind ourselves and the world that our job is not done. In the words of my favorite poet, and fortunately or unfortunately, he's a man, Robert Frost, he says, I have promises to keep, miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to sharing ideas and hearing from the voices of these other fantastic women who are here this morning to spend time with us. Thank you very much for taking the time to spend with us and also to the brave young men in this room. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.